into this. Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 2, and uh, we're going to be there. We actually was there a little bit uh, last week. Um, this, this message is going to sort of have multiple scriptures. They'll be up on the screen, but you'll have a chance to turn uh, to some of those a- as well. So we started a series of messages a couple of weeks ago, just simply entitling it uh, Essential Family. And uh, we're covering a variety of issues that are uh, uh, pertinent to families, uh, maybe marriage. Um, uh, we talked about fatherhood, uh, discipling your, your children um, coming up. And um, we've said you don't have to be uh, uh, married. You don't have to even consider yourself to, to have a big family or even any family you can be single. And uh, we know that when God's word is proclaimed, uh, he tells us, he assures us that his word doesn't go out void, right? And so we know when we come to worship with an open heart, a ready ear to listen, God is going to speak. And so uh, that's my hope and prayer that he would do so as he promises he will. But um, today, let's just, let me just th- show you my cards right off the bat. We're, we're going, it's, we're, this is going to be a message about sex. And th- this is going to be more far-reaching than your seventh grade, you know, sex ed class. Um, today, I'm going to show you uh, the, the biblical picture uh, of sex, uh, try to look to see what God was up to as he created uh, this, and ultimately even, and we've been talking about this, how, how marriage and, and even sex points ultimately to the gospel in beautiful ways. Now, um, my assumption probably is that for most of you, even if you've attended church, maybe the majority of your life, you have rarely, if ever, heard an entire message to vote to this, right? Uh, I know that back in 2012, I did something similar, it's obviously a little uh, different than this, but I did something similar, but for most of us, the majority, like this is probably the first time you've ever heard a, uh, a message uh, on this topic. And you know, I, I even know that maybe perhaps there's some say, you know what, I'm just not sure the church really is the place that we talk about this, right? But I, I honestly just, with all due respect, would say it's just the opposite, in fact, I believe that uh, part of the problems that we see often in our culture, in society, is the fact that the church is too silent and too many issues for too, too long. And, and while the, the church is virtually silent on the issues of sex, the culture has been engaged in a sexual revolution for the past 60 years, right? And we, we've gone from uh, Ozzie and Harriet, at least on TV, Ozzie and Harriet who slept in separate beds to uh, desperate housewives who slept in the same bed with different people. From uh, family ties to modern family, from, to Bonan- from Bonanza to Yellowstone, right? It's clear uh, culture has shifted. That's just TV, uh, it's, and of course just, that's just simply heterosexual relationships. There's obviously a lot more that we, that we could talk about. But, but here's the thing I think that happens often in the church, and, and even sometimes the, the church gets this uh, confused. Listen, sex is not a bad word. God created sex. And in the context of his original design, sex is not bad, sex is not dirty, sex is not taboo. In the same way that we looked at last week, that God created man and woman, that same God created sex. And he said that everything he created was what? Good. It was good. In fact, we could say this is how we spell sex. We would say that it was spelled simply as good. Now, I thought about putting sex is good on the screen. I was like, that's gonna, somebody's going to take that. Somebody's going to take a picture that's going to end up on Facebook or Twitter, you know, and I'm going to have to defend myself all the way. Like, I, I know how y'all are. I didn't want to do that, right? Um, but, but Genesis 2, 24 says, for this reason, that's why a man leaves a father and mother and to be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, that passage alone tells us really all we need to know about marriage and sex and God's design for it all. The, the act of becoming one flesh here, it's not just simply a reference to sex, but it's best demonstrated in the act of sex. When a, a man and a woman engage in intercourse to become one. And, and by the way, this is one of the reasons that marriage, uh, that, that sex outside of marriage can be absolutely detrimental. Because the act of sex by design, it draws you into deep union with another person. 
And when that union is just casually done away with, or it's just casual, uh, you know, overall, it, uh, it causes many, many problems. It hurts immensely. I think of it described it like this before. Think about a piece of plywood. Okay, you know with a piece of plywood, you know how they make plywood. You take two pieces of, of wood and you put them together. So with plywood, you have a, a, a piece of wood that's sort of relatively weak on its own. And, uh, but it, they, they retain their individual characteristics. But when you put them together, they make something new. Now, have you ever tried to tear a piece of plywood apart? Maybe not, but you can do it. You can do it, but you can't do it without tearing it up and harming the original piece. That's the, in the same way, that's the union that sex creates. It's a bond uh, to, to come together. Uh, that, that's why uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking to the church about sexual immorality that's going on. And it's rampant in this culture. In fact, there was uh, like temple prostitution going on in, in the city of Corinth. And so these believers are actually engaging in this. And listen to how Paul describes this. You don't have to turn this. This will be up on the screen. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute, uh, and, and of course, you know, just give an example here, but, but it can be any person. Uh, a prostitute you, is one with her in body. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. To become one flesh. Now, in a world that wants to tell us that sex is just this physical act between two consenting adults, nothing, hear me out, nothing can be further from the truth. During the intercourse, two become one. This is by God's design, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all together. And this is one of the reasons why God reserves sex for marriage. It's bigger than just pleasure. Okay, now, we're, we're going to talk about pleasure here in just a moment. It's part of it, but God gave this gift for, so, like, for, for, for more than just that. In fact, that's part of the reason why we would say that, and, and we'll see this in just a moment, that sex is self-giving. Now, the late Tim Keller said, it says non-verbally, I belong exclusively to you. I belong exclusively to you. In fact, and in, in what, we'll, what we understand as we see the, what, how God sort of helps us to, uh, you know, to see all of this, in just a few moments, we're going to take communion together. And really, communion to the life of a believer is what sex, the act of sex is to uh, husbands and, and wives. Um, when a husband and wife come together, they're renewing their covenant that they're made. They're renewing their covenant each time, saying, I pledge my life to you. You are mine and nobody else. But the world's made it a dirty word, right? The world's made sex a dirty word. It's a, they, a billion-dollar industry. Did you know that? God intended sex to be beautiful and good, and, but, but, but this is what happens when we fail to steward His gifts properly. right? God can give a gift, but if we don't steward it the right way, it can become less than good. In fact, here's what happens. Because we're not, we're not stewarding this gift God gives us, sex, we lose an O in sex, and sex becomes God. It's sex as God. And isn't that the prevailing message in our culture today? We are told that pursue sex at any cost. And what happens is it becomes this appetite this monstrous appetite that we have to feed if you're single the god of sex convinces you that you don't need to wait until you're married why postpone pleasure you deserve it and besides that's what everybody else is doing anyway and young people and old people like we hear this message every day like it's unrealistically for you to wait until you're married right try it before you buy it and you buy this lie of satan and it creates a regret it creates pain and then one day you do get married but with this god of sex like if that's been your god you're married even and guess what happens instantly that's not all fixed no no you discover that that god of sex is now standing between you and your spouse still there 
hasn't gone anywhere. Just because you're married, you think, well, that'll fix it, right? No, 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 that, that doesn't fix anything. And the problem is now you no longer think about sex just with your husband or wife. You want more. you got to have more, and so you pursue it in pornography. Or maybe you pursue it by, you know, even with someone else who isn't your spouse. you got to find a way to feed this God. And the bigger it gets, the deeper you go, the bigger it gets, the further you keeps you from your husband and your wife. Listen, church, this is one of the reasons why pornography today, it's a bigger industry than the NFL, the uh, uh, NBA, and Major League Baseball combined it generates more revenue than all of those things combined right we're feeding this monster we're worshiping this god Uh, mission frontiers uh, reported in 2020 a study found 57 percent of pastors reported that the most sexually damaging issue to their congregation is pornography it's pornography Pornography, did you know this? It increases marital infidelity by 300%. The largest consumer of pornography on the internet is boys ages 12 to 17. 90% of children between 8 and 18 or 8 and 16 have viewed pornography on the internet. And as a result, like it's, it's increased sexual activity i could give you stat after stat you can go look these up this isn't anything like you can just google these things like it'll make you cringe that's why parents listen don't be naive about what your kids are doing online pay attention we have handed them access to all the pornography they could ever want when we hand them a phone or when we let them get on the computer on the internet right we're raising a children we're raising a generation and it continues to be like this isn't just new to the you know this century but but we're like now maybe more than ever we're raising kids in a world where sex is god your parental responsibility is to teach them that sex has two o's it's good but it's only good within the context of a marriage between a husband and a wife who've committed themselves to each other in the sacred covenant of that marriage And so, parents, let me say this to you. Your kids need to hear what you have to say about sex. They need to hear. If you don't tell them, their friends will. If you don't teach them, TikTok will. If you don't tell them, uh, the chances are they're going to jump on whatever's trending in that day. They're going to go right along with it, right? And so we have a responsibility, parents, to teach them that sex is good. But this is what happens when it becomes a God. It never ends. You remember Solomon? Remember Solomon? Uh, Solomon was uh, King David's son. And, and, and incredibly, God tells Solomon, hey, whatever you want for, you can ask and I will give it, for, give it to you. And Solomon didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for many of the things that maybe many of us would ask for. He asked for wisdom. But Solomon was anything but wise toward the end of his life. In fact, Solomon, for Solomon, sex became his God. And he had a thousand women in his life between his concubines and, his, uh, and those who he had married. He built pagan altars where, they, where sex was performed uh, and, and they were worshipped as pagan gods. And his life was spiraling out of control largely because of this God of sex, the more he desired, the more he fed, and it didn't fill him up, and he just left him wanting more and more and more and more. And that's why it's so incredible. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon's got absolutely everything. He's got money and power and sex and all that, and he's pursued that to unlike anybody ever ever has. And he says this at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. What's the conclusion of all this? Like, what does any of this thing, like, is that the goal? Is that the good? Like, what's best? He says, Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the the whole duty of man. Solomon wraps it up. He's like, man, I've seen it all. I've had it all. I've done it all. Fear God. That's the whole duty of man. In fact, 1 Kings 11 tells us as Solomon grew older, you know what happened? His wives turned his heart away from God. That's the power that sex as God has in our life. For others, um, it's not so much that we've lost the O when it comes to sex. Uh, you know, for some, sex has become God. We've lost the O. But for others, you've lost the D. 
And so sex is not God, but you see sex as, as goo. As goo. It's a, it's a necessity for having kids. It's a, it's a, it, for any other reason, it's, it's dirty. It, it feels sinful. You would, uh, you would just, you'd be content avoiding it altogether. Uh, I heard a, a, a story about a married couple that viewed, at least the wife sort of viewed sex as goo. And uh, the doctor had given this, this couple a terrible report concerning the health of her husband. And, and um, uh, the doctor asked the wife, said, hey, can we speak in private here for, for just a few moments? And, and when the door was shut, the, 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 the doctor says to the wife, said, look, I got some bad news. I think your husband is probably going to die within a week. He's probably going to die within a week. But, but he doesn't, like, but the good news is that if you'll cook him three meals a day, if you'll bring him back breakfast in bed, if you'll pamper him, if you'll make love to him like you did as much in the first year of your marriage, I think he actually might live for a year or two. Year or two. Well, the wife goes out of the waiting room, and her husband said, well, what did the doctor say? He said, you got bad news. You're going to die. You're going you know, you're gonna, you're gonna to die, right? And so that's the way some people see it, right? We see it as good. Like, in a church, I think we've added to this. Uh, because the Christian response to sex as God is, well, sex is, is goo. And so we've swung the pendulum all the way to the other side, right? And we just see it as something bad. Now, I, I will say this. For, for some of you, you think of sex as goo be- out of your, like, it's, it's because you've been hurt. You've been harmed. Um, maybe you were sexually violated, as a child, your first encounter came at the hands of someone you trusted against your own will. That's, t- that's difficult to overcome. Uh, for others, maybe sex has now become goo to you because of the way you've, you've allowed it to do. You've, it's, it's become a tool for your manipulation. You, it's become a tool that you can allow, like you can get something done. Uh, you know, it's a way to leverage your husband. It's a way to leverage your wife if you want them to do something. Maybe it's just a, a, mis, a, a manipulation tool for you. But here's the problem with both those spellings. When sex is your God and you're married, your spouse is just an object. He or she's a means to an end. When sex is goo, if you're married, your spouse is an enemy. And you use it like that, in both cases, true intimacy is going to be absent. And here's what happens. I, you know, Satan will come along and he'll capitalize on your misspellings of these words. And he'll drive a wedge between you and your spouse. And that wedge will cause major, major problems for your marriage. So why did God give us this? Like, what is all this about? Like, what, what's the purpose of, of sex? this this gift in marriage let me give you three things and this is going to be three uh three p's right a good preacher alliteration going on this morning so the first one simply is this the first and i don't think they're going to be up on screen but the first one simply is it is for pleasure pleasure Uh, proverbs 5 says this may your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth a loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. And some of you are thinking, that's in the Bible, right? I didn't know that was in the Bible. You know, are we going there? We just wait until I read a passage here in just a minute. Like, then you're going to really, some of you are really going to sit up and finally start listening here in just a minute. But, but like, what a great prayer to pray. As you age, Lord, May I be satisfied always with my husband. Lord, help me to always be satisfied with my wife. May I be intoxicated by her love, by his love, and nothing else. Lord, may sex never be my God. May it be like, like I, may I never be drunk by any other means. That's pretty clear, right? The Proverbs author here is talking about this blessing of intimacy with your spouse. You think that's steamy. Let me give you one more. Turn to sin. I'm going to let you turn this time because you may not believe me if you you just see it up on the screen. This is going to be in Song of Songs in chapter 7 or the Song of Solomon maybe 
If, if, uh, turn there if you want to, or maybe you can trust me. Hopefully you will. But either way, this is the most erotic book in Scripture. And what we're going to see here is you get this blow-by-blow description of Solomon making love to his wife, not once, but twice. And after this erotic dance she performs, he encourages her verbally by telling her how attractive she is. He, He starts at her feet, and he works his way up. And so listen to what God's Word says, verse, uh, in chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hand. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, the twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are are the pools of Heshbon by the gates of the bath rabim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. I don't know if that pickup line translates today, but you can try it if you you want to. It worked for uh, his wife. Uh, Verse 5, your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing my love with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine. The fragrance of your breath like apples and your mouth be like the best wine right some of you are thinking i found me a book in the bible i'm going to read finally right you know finally got something i'm going to i'm going to go home and read that right it's this incredible section of scripture all right and this like and, and i read you like didn't even realize that that was in the bible what he's literally saying that he wants to to make love to his to his wife and i guarantee you that the conversation didn't start with hey i'm ovulating let's get this over with right he, he's, he's saying, like, this isn't just an effort to make kids. The husband here and his wife, they're exercising one flesh. And they're coming together to steward and enjoy this most intimate and beautiful act that a couple can engage in. And it was purely for the sake of pleasure. When sex is good, it produces pleasure for both of you. But here's where I think we get this wrong. And young people, sir, you don't have to be young. Single people, just listen up, right? It doesn't matter. Like, regardless, here's where I think that we get this wrong so often. We make romance and eventually marriage primarily about our sexual attraction. And what we do is we hope friendship will grow out of that. You tracking with me? We, we hope that romance and sexual attraction, we make that the primary deal for dating and relationships and marriage, and we hope friendship will grow out of that. But friendship and covenant, hear me, friendship and covenant, marriage covenant, should be the basis for your marriage, and guess what? Sex grows out from that. But we get it backwards, right? Not, not, not the former. And listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be attracted to the, to the person you're potentially going to marry if, you're, if you want to be married someday and you're not. But that can't be your primary goal, right? It, friendship, covenant, and of course, a faith that is grounded in Jesus. Like, don't settle. Do not settle, right? And, and it, like... Like, just because, especially what happens, we settle because we're like, man, she is so fine. Like, he is so good looking. Like, and we settle. But if that's the basis, like, it, for your marriage, like, if it begins with attraction and sex and you hope friendship and covenant's going to follow, like, you're setting yourself up for a problem down the road. You understand that? God gives us this gift. It's a beautiful gift. It's for pleasure. Secondly, he gives it to us for procreation. Now, I'm, I'm going to not labor on this at all, okay? But God obviously gives us sex as the means in which uh, the life is created, right? And so the very first command that God gives uh, Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply. 
this is, uh, uh, oftentimes this is referred to as the cultural mandate. So that's the second. So pleasure, procreation, and then finally, protection. Protection. Did you know that a healthy sex life protects the marriage from intruders? It does. From intruders like pornography, uh, affairs. You know that even a healthy sex life, and you can read and you can, you know, search this if you want to just be careful what you're searching but i mean like physically what we see like uh, emotionally there's like there's uh health benefits it's in, it's incredible uh, listen to what the apostle paul has to say though about protecting your marriage in first corinthians 7 you're welcome to turn there it's going to be up on the screen but listen to what he says he says now for matters that you wrote about it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a, a woman. In other words, like, Paul's telling the church, listen, it's fine to be single. <laughs> like I'm talking about sex all, like t- today, but you understand, it's fine to be single. In fact, it's good. It's even good. Uh, but, verse 2, since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. And by duty, he means sex. He he is saying, don't neglect each other. Now, this would be a common thought for men in the first century to be able to say that, hey, wives, don't neglect your men, but for Paul to say this to the ladies, like this is uh, revolutionary. Verse 4, the wife does not have, he says, authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but he yields it to his wife. Don't deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what did Paul say is the only exception for, for marriage couples here to abstain from sex is, is what? Prayer. <laughs> I'm like, Paul, I can pray. I can do both at the same time. But, but, but that's what he says. Right? You know, uh, only like, and only if it's mutual. You know, well, well, what, what, if I'm, what if I'm not in, in, in the mood? Paul said, listen, you, you understand. Your body doesn't just belong to you. It belongs to your husband. It belongs to, to your wife. And, and again, some of you are thinking, I'm glad I came to church today because I got a verse, right? And I'm glad I came to church today to hear all this. Thank you, Lord. But listen, God's word is not a weapon to wield, all right? It's instruction to teach us about life and how he's ordained life and for, for, for even marriages to thrive. And listen, this is why we have to understand, church, this is why all of life is connected to the gospel. Even the act of sex reflects our relationship with God. How? Well, that's what Paul's telling us here. In in Ephesians 5, what's he say? He says, husbands, you love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's connected. Your relationship with your spouse is connected to your relationship with God. It's it's connected. Uh, Here, he says, husbands and wives, it's not just about yourself. Sex is self giving not simply about being the mood it's serving it's putting the other person ahead of your own see church and listen this is the one thing i hope that we always understand and we try to grasp is that every aspect of our life should reflect this new reality of who we are in christ everything and but let me just say this because i know somebody's going to take me out of context here okay and and there may be some confusion This works both ways. We are called to be sacrificial in life uh, with our husbands and wife, even, Paul says, in the bedroom. But understand this. If Jesus is front and center in your life, you will never demand that your spouse do something that he or she doesn't want to do. This isn't about getting your way or pointing to a verse or just saying you have to. No, no, that would never be the case. In marriage, you know what we're constantly doing? We're submitting. We're surrendering to each other. We're putting the other person's need ahead of our own because that's what Jesus has done for us. 
You see, it all fits together. This isn't about, hey, you know, me and my. No, no, it's totally opposite of that. But the good news is, the good news is a healthy and frequent sex life keeps your spouse satisfied and protects your marriage from intruders. I, I heard, remember, uh, there was a colonist many, many years ago. I, I don't know, maybe they still do this column. Obviously, it's, it's not her, but Ann Landers. Some of you remember that Ann Landers column? Um, she received this from someone many years ago. It said this, Dear Ann, Last weekend we celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. This morning they left on a, a long-awaited trip to Hawaii. They were, they were as excited as if it was uh, their honeymoon. You see, she said, when my parents were married, they only had enough money for a three-day trip, 50 miles from home, and so they made a pact that each time that they made love, they'd put a dollar in a special metal box and they'd save it for their honeymoon, uh, or they'd save it for a honeymoon in Hawaii on their 50th year wedding anniversary. Said dad was a policeman, mom was a school teacher, raising five children was a challenge and sometimes money was short, but no matter what emergency came up, said dad wouldn't let mom take any money out of the Hawaii account. Macy, she said, my parents were always very much in love. I can remember dad coming home and telling mom, I got a dollar in my pocket. And she would smile and say, and I know just how to spend it. <laughs> and when the children were married, she said, mom and dad, they'd give each other a, uh, when the children got married, their parents gave them each a small metal box. And they let them in on their secret. And she said, we found it inspiring. Mom and dad, the, the person wrote in, said, never told us how much money they managed to save, but it must have been a considerable amount because they cashed in those CDs, had enough for airfare to Hawaii, plus hotel accommodations for 10 days, and plenty of spending money. And the night before they boarded the plane, dad winked at us and said, tonight we're starting an account for Cancun. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful picture, though? Like, that's the way God intended sex to be, intimate Beautiful, compassion, frequent, loving, pure, enjoyable, all within the confines of a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. G good. Good. A few statements, and I'm going to wrap it up. All right? A few statements. First, listen. You can live your entire life without sex and be in great company. Please don't get me, don't, don't, don't misunderstand this. You can live your entire life and be in great company. Jesus never had sex. Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elijah, likely the Apostle Paul. We're not 100% sure if he was married or not at some point. But sex is not a need like food and water. You're going to be fine without it, all right? You're going to be, I've been talking about this gift. We need to understand this gift. We need to know what, what it's like, but you're going to be fine without it, okay? So, first. Second, how you handle sex will either confirm or contradict about what you say you believe about God. Listen, we live in a time, like in a culture, like it's super easy to point fingers out there and talk about those people. But you hear me say this so often. If you want to know what you believe, well, you better pay attention how you act, like how you behave. If you obey God in every other area in your life, but you're a rebellion in this single area, please understand partial obedience is still disobedience. All right? And so... It's going to contradict or it's going to confirm what you say or what, how, or what you believe about God. I imagine that for many of us in here today, the God of sex needs to be squashed. The God of sex needs to be destroyed in our life. Thirdly, if you're married, you need to take ownership of your marriage. Read marriage books together. Pray together. Go to counseling Get professional help if you, like, and even if you think, I'm not even really sure we need it, like, there's nothing wrong with counseling. Get some help. Do whatever it takes to make your marriage last. Jenny told me just this week, she said when she was four years old, her parents were on the brink of divorce. 
They were dealing with some things that just seemed like the best solution was just to simply let it go and part ways. But they took ownership of their marriage. They went to counseling and they celebrated 50 years of marital bliss just this past week. Take ownership of your marriage. Fourth, understand whether you're young or old or whatever it may be, please don't misunderstand. Like, understand or don't misunderstand. Listen, sex is intended for marriage. God is not trying to keep you from having fun. God is not trying to be a killjoy. In fact, He is protecting you. He is protecting you from using this in a way that will ultimately harm you. It's intended for marriage because it demands a total commitment to each other. It demands a total commitment to each other inside this covenant relationship. Adam and Eve, what's the scripture say? They were naked but unashamed. And then finally, even God's design for sex and ultimately marriage, it points us to the good news of Jesus Christ. It points us to the gospel we, we, you, what, is, what do we often, or what does Scripture often refer to, and we've even heard it this morning, the church. It is the bride of Christ. She is the bride. That's why when we talk about the church, we refer to her as a, as a she. She is the bride of Christ. And Jesus has died for his bride. He died for his bride. He's totally committed to her, even though often it is one-sided. And what has he done? He's made an exclusive covenant with his church. And out of that covenant comes all of those things that are true about marriage today. And even sex, right? Out of that covenant becomes uh, the, the, of our with, covenant with God. Pleasure, joy. Like that only comes from a, a life in Jesus, ultimate pleasure. Protection. We are protected. Nobody can rob you and take your salvation from you. Not even Satan. And new life ultimately comes in a relationship with Jesus. Folks, it all points back to the gospel. Everything, right? Today, today, what, what is it for you? How, how is God speaking to you today? Maybe for many of you, it's time to squash your sex God. And get rid of some of that junk that you're doing feeding that monster. Right? Today, like... That maybe like it is time to be done with that because that appetite is never ever ending. Maybe for others, maybe it's the time to change the situation that you're in. Maybe it's time to tell him or her that hey, I'm not going there anymore. You know why? Well, if you know, I'm, I'm waiting as as God has designed all this and for marriage. And, uh, and that's a hard pill to swallow if you're in a dating relationship. But uh, if he or she is not good with that, then you're wasting your time with them anyway. Or maybe today if you're single. Or maybe you're married. Like you don't have to be single. Regardless of where, like if porn is a problem. Like it's time to say, you know what, God, by your power, I'm going to, that, that chain, that, that, like that thing that has had me in bondage. Like, I'm surrendering that to you today. Listen, you will never find the intimacy you were created for in a video. You need to repent of that sin, expose it to the light. Secret sin, just, it just keeps being a temptation more and more. The good news, the good news for all this, though, church, is that we serve a God who's big enough to cover us and to give us grace in multiple areas where we've absolutely blown it. And every person in here has blown it to some degree, and it comes to this subject. But God's grace is available. God's grace is free. God's grace is good. But he wants us to turn from that junk, to repent. There's like forgiveness is always connected to our repentance. And so God wants us to repent of those sins. Maybe today that's an area, wherever it may be, that we trust God for in this. Well, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll go into a, a time of decision and and again, if it's something today that you want to expose to the light and come forward, maybe even publicly confess where you feel like you've fallen short, well, I'll let you do that. Share maybe how God is, what God has done and what God continues to do. Or maybe just come forward 
Uh, I'm happy to pray with you. you you're, you're able to come forward for, for prayer on your own if you want to do that, whatever it may be. Let me, uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll move into our time of decision. Let's pray. Oh, God, we, uh, we're amazed at how good you are. We're amazed at how you've made us, how your creation, Lord, even sex points us back to, to the gospel. Lord, we've, uh, we, have not, um, we have not handled this well. And Lord, I know that, that every person in this room, we've, we've failed in some degree. Lord, you even tell us that if our eyes cause us to lust, that we've committed adultery. And so every one of us, Lord, we've fallen short, but we that's why we just rely on your grace and Lord but I don't want to just simply just ask for forgiveness God but may our hearts be turned to you today completely full surrender so Lord work on our hearts even as I speak God I just pray that um, that your work in their lives 